Good. Well, welcome to our service this morning. We are Rock Baptist Church. We are expecting guests with us this morning. Uh, we've had uh, someone contact us through the website and uh, some friends of folks who come regularly to Rock for joining us. We have folks, therefore, from all over the world. You're very welcome with us. We love, we love having new folks. I'll tell you at the beginning, we, we keep our service to, to around an hour, under an hour if we can. We find Zoom doesn't really lend itself well to longer services. But at the end of the service, we'll have what we call breakout groups, which is where rather than a whole gallery of people on your screen, there'll just be three or four a chance to catch up in place of our normal tea and coffee that we'd have after the end of normal services. Uh, we're going to begin our service, as we often do, with a, a reading, something which reminds us of the, the wonderful truths that lie at the heart of the Christian faith. And uh, Ruth Rycroft has very kindly said that she'll read for us. Uh, so give me a moment, Ruth, before you begin. If you want to put your uh, camera on, Ruth, so we can see you. There we go. I'm going to spotlight you. And there we go. Here's our reading. Hit it, Ruth. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. The person who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not go God because God is love. This is how God showed his love to us. He sent his only son into the world to give us life through him. True love is God's love for us, not our love for God. God sent his son to die in our place to take away our sins. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll get you off camera now. We don't want to be there for too long. Good. We're back to me, I think. They're, they're lovely verses. That's from the International Children's Bible. It, it's a great reminder of what lies at the heart of the Christian faith. Not that we think we're good people. Not that we think we have earned God's favour in our moral goodness. Quite the opposite. We recognise that we are a fallen, sinful people. But God is a merciful God. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he, he placed the punishment on his son rather than us that we might be forgiven. A true love, verse 10, is God's love for us, not our love for God. God sent his son to die in our place to take away sins. We've been using uh, prayers from various churches around the world. There's a lovely, um, there's great value in, in reading the, the written down services, the liturgy of various church denominations around the world and at different points of history. And I've been enjoying doing that through the summer. Uh, here, here's a prayer from the Anglican Church of Canada, which uh, I thought was really great and I, I want to share with you this morning. So uh, as we have God's word ringing in our ears, let's bow our heads uh, and pray a prayer of, of repentance for sin. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We've followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts and we have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. There is no health in us. But you, our Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare us, O God, spare us who confess our sins. Restore us who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, we're going to sing our, our first song, which uh, just captures some of those thoughts. Our hope before God rests not in ourself and what we have done but in the Lord Jesus Christ and all he has accomplished for us. My hope rests firm in Jesus Christ. Feel free to hit mute on your microphones and sing loudly at home as we sing together. My hope rests firm. <laughs> i 
to show you this we're, we're, we're going to pray for our young folks and uh, we're going to have a bible story and a song for them but right at the beginning of that since they may not be here when we come to our notices at the end i wanted to tell you about a competition the bible society is having uh, it's to win uh, um, the minecraft bible stories in, in book form uh, uh, but the, the way you enter the competition is you create a minecraft image that, that encapsulates a particular Bible story. Think of your favorite Bible story, make that scene on Minecraft and take a photo of it and send it in. It would be lovely. I know we've got lots of uh, young folks at Rock who, who like Minecraft. Why don't, with your mum and dad or with a friend, why don't you think about a story that you could do? Wouldn't it be awesome if Rock won? <laughs> we may well hand out chocolate, even virtually, to the winning entry. So why not have a think about that? If that's something you think you can do, we'd love to uh, we'd love to help you in any way we can. I mentioned we're going to pray for our young folks, and Glenford is going to lead us in prayer. Uh, you're going to have to bear with me just a sec, Glenford, while I find you on my screen. No, not there. Oh, Glenford, where are you? <laughs> I? There we go, there we go, there we go, Glenford. Great, thank you. Why not lead us in prayer, Glenford? As, as Mike said, Keith is not here today, but he sent a, a very good email, which I'll summarize before we pray about, about the young people's work. So the young people haven't been able to meet up and they have really missed that face-to-face -face interaction more, 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 um, more than the adults would. They've enjoyed the, the meeting online and, and recently, Keith and Ruth and others organized a face-to-face -face session using the garden of, of Queen Elizabeth Chapel, and that was really appreciated. There's also a meeting for the girls at, at Rachel's, organized by Rachel and Dawn, and Ross and Katie organized something for, for the guys, so that, that was really good. There's also prayer for individual family situations. We know that the young people are, are less prone to, to get illness from the virus, but there's a lot of concern um, with them with regard to the older members of their families or their parents and their grandparents. So, so it is a stressful situation even for them. 
talked about praying for the future as well. Um, currently, the impact group is, is having a two week break, but the rest of the summer needs to be organized. And also autumn, autumn will bring its own challenges in terms of meeting restrictions and social distancing, which will be with us for some time. So we do need to pray that they would be useful online as well as face-to-face -face interaction. New people are also joining the group, so people moving up from rock solid to impact and impact to, to blueprint. And finally, let's, we, we, we do need to pray for the leaders, as, as a lot of them have young families, and therefore we need to pray that God would be with them. So let's pray together quickly. Lord, we want to thank you for the young people that you've given us at Rock. Thank you for the, the blessing that you've given them in terms of enabling them to know you at a young age. We pray that this would spur them on to acknowledge you and your son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, Lord, and King. We also give thanks for leaders of Blueprint and Impact, Laurie and Anne Cecile, Dan and Katie, Alex and Nicola. We pray that you bless them as they continue to serve. They all have young and growing families, and so we want to pray that you sustain them, as well as for new leaders to emerge among us. We give thanks for others who work a lot behind the scenes, including Bev, Rachel, Dawn, Ruth, Ruth and Keith, Ross and Katie, and others preparing material and teaching our young people. We ask that you would help our young people as they cope with the current situation, where face-to-face -face interaction is limited and will be so for some time. We pray that whatever online and face-to-face -face interactions that are planned would be useful and effective in maintaining their mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Finally, we want to pray for wisdom for the leaders as they make plans for the future. And we pray for those moving up into new classes in the autumn. In many ways, this current situation is so beyond what we've ever experienced. And that makes future planning on any level very difficult. So we want to ask that you give them insight and discernment as they look to you, O oh God. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Glenford. Uh, we are going to have a, a story now, and uh, guys, you're in for a treat, uh, because it's not me reading it this week, uh, the Bible story, but Rachel. I'm here. There we go. I've spotlighted your video. And uh, away you go, Rachel. I'll just wait for you to put the picture up. There we go. <laughs> Every year, Mary and Joseph, along with many other people, travelled to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple. In the Bible, we read what happened on one of these trips. When Jesus was 12 years old, he went with his neighbours and his parents, Mary and Joseph, to the temple in Jerusalem just as they did every year. But when they arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went straight to the temple. He started asking questions and talking to God about God with the wise old teachers that were there. Jesus listened to them teaching and asked them questions too. They were amazed at how much this boy understood. He understood everything in the scriptures. When it was time to go home, all the families traveled together. Joseph and Mary thought Jesus was walking with some of his friends. But after a while, when they went to find Jesus, they couldn't find him anywhere. No one had seen him all day. He must have been left behind, said Joseph. So they hurried back to look for him. Mary and Joseph searched the city for a long time. At last they found Jesus in the temple. We've been looking for you, they said. Didn't you know I was in my father's house, said Jesus. He went straight home with them. Jesus always listened to his parents and obeyed them. And Mary, she never forgot how much Jesus loved God's word, even when he was a little boy. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Now, uh, uh, Jesus was, even from a, a young boy, devoted to God's word. He, he understood the value of getting into the Bible and learning it inside out. And uh, we're going to have a, a little quiz in a moment uh, to see how well you know the books of the Bible. But uh, to help you guys, before we have our quiz, we've got a wrap that helps us learn all of the books in the Bible. Ready? Time for the quiz. <laughs> Boys and girls, uh, either you need to get to the keyboard or your parents can type for you. 
but we're going to see how well you know the books of the Bible. You might even want to test your mum and dad as well. Uh, here we go. What comes next in the sequence? Let's see who can get this one. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Write your answer in the chat box now. Oh, the Peckhams, very good. Numbers from the Days and Dukes and the Peckhams, very good. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Everyone's got the right answer. Well done, Marshalls. I suspect that's James. Uh, well done. It is the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. On the Palmers, I've just typed in Numbers. All right, here's the next question. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings. Let me have the 2 Kings from the Peckhams. You can see I've made the questions too easy for you guys. That Harry and Jessica, Charlotte have got two kings, well done. The Days and Dukes, there's two families there. Two kings, it wasn't James. <laughs> <laughs> well done, uh, Rebecca or Sarah, or whoever that was there. Uh, let's go for our third question. Matthew, Mark, Luke. What's the next one in the sequence? A pause this time. Peckins have got the book of John, the days and dukes of John, Abraham's John, Mercer's of John. Very good, very good. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John of the four gospels. Very good. All right. Which book of the Bible is the last book in the Old Testament? Which book of the Bible is the last book in the Old Testament? <clears throat> very good. Jackson says Malachi. The Marshals have. Malachi 2. Well done. Harry and Jessica got Malachi. The Days and Dukes got Malachi. I never know if you're just copying the first answer, hoping it was right. But if you are, you should get marks for ingenuity. Very good. Malachi is indeed the right answer. What's the first book in the New Testament? What's the first book in the New Testament? Oh. Either my internet's gone down or you guys don't know the answer to that one. Oh, here we go. Here they come flooding in. Matthew from the Peckhams, Matthew from the Abrahams, Matthew from the Mercers. Very good. Which leaves us, you've got that one right, Matthew is. Malachi to Matthew. Final one. Which book of the Bible has the most chapters in it? Which book of the Bible has the most chapters? Very good. The Peckhams are right there on the ball again. Pastors' kids have been taught well. It is indeed the Psalms. The Days and the Dukes have got the Psalms. 150 of them. Very good. All right. Uh, first, I would like to thank God Almighty for giving me knowledge and strength and ability to complete the re this research study. Without his blessings, this achievement would not, not have been possible. Thank you for my church family at Rock Baptist for all their prayers and encouragement in completing this dissertation. We're going to think in our uh, sermon as we look at the first commandment about what it means to live our life of, of loyalty to the Lord our God, acknowledging him in all things. And isn't that a, a wonderful example? Uh, just for a moment then, let me stop sharing the screen. Oops. And if I can find you, Helena, bear with me. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> waving to help me along that's good uh so listen you're, that brings your studies to a, a formal close i'm guessing yes all done now what lies in the future for you helena um moving to switzerland <laughs> tell us a bit about that uh, i've been searching for jobs and i have a, an interview um in a, on the 10th of august so i'm flying out to geneva on Sunday next week, Sunday night. That's exciting. And that will be to do what? It will be to teach English to young, young kids. English as a foreign language. Brilliant. Well, we're certainly going to be praying for you. And, uh, well, yeah, it will be sad to lose you, but we're glad that you've got this opportunity. Uh, let me, here we go. Uh, Helena's going to read God's word to us. We come now to the, uh, time when we'll have the, the sermon in our service. 
Uh, boys and girls, you've been sent Sunday school material or your parents have by email through the week. Uh, I think uh, young people, you who guys who are staying for the sermon, you'll have got or your parents will have received an email this morning with uh, uh, an information sheet to help guide you through the sermon so you can stay with us. Uh, so this is the time for kids to head off if that's what's going to happen. And Helene is going to read to us from Exodus chapter 20. If you've got a Bible at home, why not get it out and turn to Exodus chapter 20? Always good if you can see it for yourself, but the words are on the screen if that helps. Over to you, Helena. The Ten Commandments. And God spoke to all and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath, uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor, your, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day in, and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Great, thank you very much, Elena. <clears throat> Well, uh, you know that we are uh, working through uh, the Ten Commandments. I just had a moment of thinking oh. my microphone wasn't on, but it is. That's good. We're, we're, we're looking through the summer at these Ten Commandments. And uh, we, we, last week you we had an introduction. This week we begin with the first, which will have no other gods before me. I, I want to read a, a verse to you from the book of 1 John, and uh, then I'll pray for our sermon. But I, I want you to see how positive it is. The New Testament writer this Old Testament. Oh, I think I should turn the microphone off. There we go. I think I've worked out who it was. Uh, the Apostle John writes this uh, 1 John 5, verse 3. This is love for God to keep his commands. All his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Let's pray as we begin. Our Father, as we come to your word and as we examine this first of the Ten Commandments, help us come with humility and help us recognise that your law is not burdensome, but is life and love and joy. Help us recognise again, despite the temptations that we might feel, that to live in accordance with your law is the very best way to live. It is a life of liberty freedom and happiness. Our Father, we uh, pray that you would help us as we understand more of what you call us to, to fight against that sinful nature which remains within us and to live a life of love and righteousness. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, look, last week we, uh, we did look at the Ten Commandments as a whole and we considered them, saw that they were the, the, the sum total of God's moral law. Uh, it, it's the place where we saw last week, God teaches us what love really means, or how love can be expressed, 
love to God, love to neighbor. We saw that the Ten Commandments serve another purpose, as well as teaching us the love, they show us our sin. And finally, we saw that the commandments lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, I'd encourage you on this occasion just to go back a week and hear an introductory sermon because it will help uh, lay the, the foundation really for what comes. This morning, however, we, we begin with this uh, first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. And uh, look, to, to try and keep things simple, just two words that I hope that you'll be able to remember, which will help you understand the nature, the, the fullness of this first commandment. The first of those words that I, I'd love for you to remember is this, authority. Authority. I am the Lord. In actual fact, the commandments, uh, or, or rather God's presentation of them, begins not with the first commandment, but with a, a short introductory sentence. Uh, we see it there at the beginning of, the, uh, of Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the Lord. That's how this presentation of the commandments begins. It begins with God in his fullness and this particular identity because the name Lord is one of those names that's rich in meaning. We're told that people called upon the name of the Lord their God even in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, but the meaning and the significance of that name seems to be particularly spelled out for Moses at the beginning of the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. It, 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 the Lord becomes the name by which God wants to be known by the Israelites in Egypt. In Hebrew, and many of you will know this already, but the, the name derives from the verb to be. It can therefore be variously translated, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. That is, this name, Lord, I am the Lord, speaks of something of God's nature and God's character. It tells us that God is self-existent, that he is eternal and that he is sovereign. He is the one who is, who has been and who always will be. He is creator, not created. He is ruler, not ruled. It's so important that the Ten Commandments begin here. This is the God who speaks, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the God who makes himself known to the world in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God who speaks. And who he, who he is has central importance to the power his words have. Uh, a few years ago now, uh, uh, two prominent atheists uh, crowdsourced new commandments for a modern age. They called them 10 non-commandments. Uh, people submitted various uh, ideas of what should be included and CNN reported that 13 uh, judges uh, decided which would make the top 10. Here's that pen. It's too small for you to read. I'm not too concerned to go into the details of it. Uh, uh, these are the 10 commandments that were chosen but actually there's one particular that strikes me as being hugely significant for the day and age we live. I'm not quite sure why, but they placed it at number nine. It's the ninth of these atheists' non-commandments, and it's this. I've highlighted it on the screen, but let me read it for you if the text is a bit small. There is no one right way to live. It, if anything, typifies the way in which the world, the Western modern world, views morality. It's surely commandment number nine of this list of non-commandments. There is no one right way to live. And if that's true, truly true, then you might rightly ask, what's the point of the other nine non-commandments? If, if point nine is true, there's only one, that there, there is no one right way to live, then all the others, one to ten, are optional and unnecessary. You'd be right to think that way. There is a a logical contradiction that lies at the heart of so much ethical and moral debate today. Are there, are there two genders or a, a vast spectrum from which we can choose? 
It is a fetus in the womb, a, a human being worthy of care and life. Or is it simply a collection of cells which can be extinguished at will? Is an adult sexual attraction to children just one in a long list of natural sexual desires which can't be helped and shouldn't be condemned? Or is it objectively and timelessly wrong? No human philosophy can finally answer those moral dilemmas because all human philosophy falls down under the most basic of questioning. The, the, the question which toddlers love to, love to ask their mothers, the question why? Why should I think your answer is right? Why should I do what you say? Why are you so confident that your moral perspective is more worthy than mine? Or Pol Pot's or Lenin or Hitler's for that matter? O on what basis can you judge between any two people's values of right and wrong and if you do make that judgment what confidence can you have that your judgment is right human philosophers simply cannot provide a convincing answer to these questions because none carry any final overarching indisputable authority which means that moral relativism as it's sometimes called is both intellectually illogical but more than that it's practically unlivable to use christian language it's not loving but hateful because it leads to confusion and argument and division but the ten commandments begin with a pronouncement of a voice from outside this closed system from god who was and is and will be the God who is eternal, the God who is sovereign, the God who is creator and redeemer and judge, the God of the Bible who speaks with full and final authority. I am the Lord. Moral good or love, as we should describe it, is not what you or I might prefer it to be. It is what this Lord God defines it to be. The beginning of the Ten Commandments then liberate us from this confusion and mess. They give us that solid foundation upon which we can live. God speaks with authority. Uh, secondly, this God who speaks with authority calls his people to loyalty. That's the second word I hope you'll remember. Notice how the, the Ten Commandments are introduced. Uh, uh, verse 1, and God spoke all these words, I am the God, uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Notice there's a recap of the history of God's people before we get to the first commandment. God's act of redemption is cited before we come to his instruction on how we should live. That order is important, and, and it's when we forget that order that we get into all kinds of problems, certainly the church has through the centuries. This law of love is given to a people already redeemed. There's never any inclination, indication that, that they must obey this law to be redeemed. No, not at all. That makes a nonsense of the beginning of Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord you got, your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now you shall have no other gods before me. The Israelites were rescued from slavery in Egypt by the Lord God. And they serve as a, as a timeless picture of how God through Christ redeems his people from sin and death and judgment. And before all else, the response to this redemption is captured in the first commandment. And it's to be one of steadfast loyalty. Notice that as the Lord speaks, he doesn't say simply, I am the Lord, which would be perfectly acceptable. Instead, almost unnecessarily, he highlights a relationship and says, I am the Lord, your God. That, that phrase speaks of a, a covenant of grace that the Lord God has made with his people. 
let's pause for a moment and think about that word covenant because it's a really key bible word it's one of those bible words that's deep and rich in meaning it's often uh, illustrated in the bible itself to help us better understand it through a human covenant the human covenant perhaps which with which we're most familiar that of marriage marriage being a lifelong promise of commitment which binds together a man and a woman in love a covenant if you've been a christian a little while i'm sure you're familiar with uh, ephesians chapter 5 where we're told that that a marriage between a man and a woman is really just a, a vivid living illustration to the world around us of this covenant relationship between Christ and the church. But, but interestingly, that way of thinking that, that God's relationship with his people is a bit like a human marriage, it is not just found in the New Testament, but, but dates right back to the Old Testament. Here's the book of Isaiah. For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. This is how God introduces himself in the commandments. The commandments then come not from a, they're not the dictates of a, of a cruel and distant tyrant. These are the words of the God who has already committed himself to his people in love and in grace. Our obedience to them begins then here in this com first commandment with an expression of love and faithfulness, loyalty to the one from whom the commandments come. We, the bride, begin to express love for our heavenly husband by being loyal. You shall have no other gods before me. It, 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 that's why this commandment comes first, because it's the basis upon which all the other commandments stand. I don't steal or covet or kill at least i try not to because i am first committed to the one who commands these things i, I rest from work to, so that i can worship on the sabbath because he says that that is right and best and good and i must trust him above all others and, and just as well i'm a married man just as no woman should take the place in my heart that's reserved only for dawn so no false god should take that primary place of love and worship in my heart that is reserved only for the lord our god the late now late great jim packer rather pithily summarized the main rivals for worship with which god contends in our sinful human hearts here's what packer wrote for us, there are still the great gods of sex, shekels and stomach, and the other enslaving trio, pleasure, possessions and position. I don't know a better summary of the, of the idols with which we contend. The first commandment calls me to give up my all, my comfort, my desires, my ambitions, my hopes, sacrifice them all before the Lord my God. The first commandment calls me to live for him and him only, not for myself, what, whatever that might bring. You remember how the Lord Jesus Christ himself put it, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's the first commandment. And look, if, if that seems negative, I want you to pause and reconsider. But I want you to see that actually, really, this first commandment elevates every part of my life as it becomes an expression of love and worship and loyalty to the God who has redeemed me. All I am, all I do, all I think, all I say, all of it becomes an expression of love to the God who made me and saved me and now calls me to obedience. There's a lovely old a Christian poem by a guy called uh, George Herbert. He, he revised it various times throughout his lifetime, but the original version he called the elixir. And it talks about what it's like to become a Christian and have our life transformed in a way that we're thinking about with the first commandment. Uh, this is how the poem goes. Teach me my God and King in all things thee to see 
and what I do in anything to do it as for thee. And then later on in the poem, he writes this. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and that action fine. That, that little phrase, makes drudgery divine, is key to understanding the impact of the first commandment. All of my life, even the most menial of tasks, becomes an expression of my love and loyalty to the Lord God who has saved me. So listen, this morning, as you reflect on this first commandment, at right at the beginning of these Ten Commandments, I, I want you to see that a response of love uh, uh, is, it begins with a life of loyalty to the Lord God who speaks with authority. Repent of those times when you have lived not for him, but for yourself. Uh, look to Christ, who shows us what true loving loyalty to his Father in heaven looks like. And join me as we call out to the Lord Jesus Christ, both for mercy to be forgiven, but also for power to change. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, forgive our unfaithfulness and our love of ourselves. Strengthen us that we might put to death our sinful nature and live instead a life of righteousness and love a life of loyal obedience to you, our Father in heaven. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song, a song that just reminds us of that great rescue God has done for us. The first response of which that he asks of us is this life of loyal obedience. We're, we're going to sing How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to
Jesus paid my ransom His wounds have paid my ransom Well, let me run through just a, a few notices for the church family so you know what's coming up. The first is to say that um, our band of brothers is uh, beginning again through the summer. Really. Which one of these foods contains a protein that... Well, I don't know where that audio came from, but anyway, some foods contain a protein. Uh, our band of brothers is a group of guys who don't preach very often, and we use this as a training opportunity, as well as an encouragement for us as a church. It would be great if uh, you were able to join us. That programme begins this afternoon at four o'clock, when our assistant minister, Matt Peckham, will do an overview of 2 Peter. That's both to help the guys who are joining in that preaching series, but also for all of us to get to grips with, a, with one letter all in one go. Uh, uh, we're also, uh, again, this is Matt Peckham. We're, we're using him a lot, aren't we? Uh, on Sunday the 9th, I think that's next Sunday at four o'clock, we have our third final in the plan series of music workshops we may continue them but particularly if you play within our music group it'd be great if you could join us of course it's open to everybody all of us sing all of us want to think through what the bible has to say about the place of music in our worship join us next sunday at four to hear about that uh, a quick note from rachel matthews rachel is our safeguarding officer you can perhaps imagine that in the day and age we're in at the moment there are all kinds of additional guidelines that are in place because of the coronavirus on how we meet and how we do things, particularly online. This is all still relatively new. Uh, Rachel sent out a, um, a consent form for parents of younger children. Uh, please do re return it to her because it makes uh, particularly our online meetings much more straightforward. Uh, we also have on the 23rd of August, that's not too far away now, our Bonkers Balloons event. Uh, we did it at the start of the summer it was so popular we're going to run it again at the end of the summer if you have friends why not uh, send them a copy of this flyer so they can book it in their diaries uh, we send it out with our midweek email why not uh, download the, 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 the flyer and send it on to them uh, now about uh, uh, ladies women's bible study uh, you guys are meeting in uh, salome's garden on tuesday morning 10 till 11. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but Brian insisted there was a legal disclaimer placed at the bottom of this slide. Uh, this is in fact not a photo of Salome's garden and Rock Baptist Church is not liable for any disappointment you may experience on seeing her quite lovely garden. All financial liability rests solely with our assistant pastor, Matt, pa Matt Peckham. Oh, that's quite harsh, Brian. And definitely not with our pastor, Mike Partridge. Uh, finally, just to say, uh, Matt's come back today. Uh, I, we hope you've had a great holiday, Matt. We've been praying for you and Lauren and for the kids. It's great to have you guys back. Now you're back. We'll have a, a little handover today and then I'm going to disappear for a week. I'm not really disappearing. It's a staycation, but I, I won't answer my emails for a week and uh, no admin. It's glorious. Oh, I should add for that then uh, that the, the, uh, the daily children's videos that we call KDD, Kids Daily Devotion, they will continue, but just to make it a bit quicker, um, I, I've, I've uh, rather than me reading the stories, I've taken uh, videos from YouTube of others reading the stories. So this week, uh, there will be KDD uh, all through the week, but it won't be me reading it, it will be someone else. It just made it more straightforward to prepare for the week off. There also won't be a live session on Friday as we do normally, but next week back to normal. Well, look, we, we've kind of got into the habit, and I'm quite enjoying it, I hope you are, of turning on our microphones at the end of our service, and we bless one another with this prayer as we say the grace together. Um, turn your microphone on, let's say this together. Now may the grace, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the love of God, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, in place of what we would normally have a time to catch up at the end of our service, we have breakout groups. Uh, we can't serve you tea and coffee centrally, but you can certainly grab a cup. There'll be three or four cups on your screen. Uh, I'll do that now. You'll get an invite that you just need to click that you'd like to join. Of course, at this point, if you'd like to log off, 
you're very welcome to. We've loved having you with us. Disappearing. Please, if you can, stay and get to know us. But look out for that invite appearing shortly. <laughs>